And what the pluckers would do would actually pluck the guard hairs off of the head, the hide, because the guard hairs doesn't really felt together when you when you're felting. Everyone knows how to make a felt hat, right? Okay. Well, with the with the with the the bottom hairs, they're actually barbed to where they felt a lot better. But the guard hairs, they don't. A lot of times, you'll see a hat that. I mean, it just looked like hair sticking everywhere. They didn't pluck all those guard hairs off. And just the, the, the bottom down fur, it's got more of a barb and they actually... <coughs> She's over here just shaking her head like, yeah. But see how it's almost like almost like a wool. Oh, clearly. And it, it felt, just go ahead and pass it around. But it felt better and that's why the mountain men were up here was to, to make the felt hats for the Eastern and uh, European hat was quite the thing. The main downfall of, there's a couple of the reasons why the downfall of the beaver came about. <clears throat> trying to get, you know, trying to find beaver in the, you know, in the eight, late 1800s was the beaver population had declined because of all the trading and the trappers. A lot of pressure. Then they came up with an animal in South America called the nutria, and the nutria is looks like a big, giant, overgrown muskrat. The hide that from the nutrias they could buy in the 1840s for like 50 cents, where a, a pound of beaver would cost you five dollars. The nutrias was costing you nothing, and they could have the same production of the felt. So they was like, hey, you know, and then all of a sudden they came up with the silk hats. And once they come up with the silk hat, then all they do is they they trying to get the worms. So luckily enough, the the worm or the silk hats came along because if not, there wouldn't have been any beaver left because there's no there were no beaver in Europe because they'd all been trapped out. That's why the American fur market mainly depended on you know making the hats. Ready to start skinning yet? Before we open it up, does anybody want to take a picture with the beaver? <laughs> Let's see if we can get him to do it. He ain't gonna stand up, is he? Yeah, he's getting right, well. Really Here, I'll hold him up for you. Go sit down. <laughs> Ready? Put put an arm over him. Here, Ani shall be going you know, the other side. Hugging your bed. There you go. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Ready? Take a picture with the beaver. Come on, we got two more. Come on over. Yep. Oh, you got to pet him. I'd like a little puppy dog. You got to pet him. Okay, <laughs> ready, Aza? In fact, I can, oh, uh, file. Okay, Aza. Okay, ready? One, two, three. The anchor bird comfort date. Perfect. Guys, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're worse than, Is this worse still than a lawyers. For beaver, then? What's that? Is there still a market for those pelts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, like you were saying, in Utah, for a prime blanket, Six dollars. Six dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What I do with my beaver is I send them off to a tannery in Duluth, Minnesota. And for $27.50, I can have one tan. Then I turn around and sell them to the unsuspecting public for twice of what I've got invested in. So I can take a beaver like that and in any one of these guys here, I can sell that same beaver to an unsuspecting tourist, 50 to $75 in a heartbeat. Are there unsuspecting tourists around here? Well, I hope so, because I got about four or five of them for sale, if you There want. you go. <laughs> What's the biggest beaver you ever caught? 70 pounds. I got one for 60. And she was she was a female with, with four pups inside her when I trapped her. Trapped her the last day of the season. And, you know, that was, the, that was the largest one I ever caught out of the Platte River. Most of the most of the mountain beaver are a little bit lighter. It seems like, yeah, it's really weird. The mountain muskrats are smaller. The mountain beaver are smaller compared to the river river rats and the and the river beaver. So this this beaver here is actually I, I trapped this beaver this spring, 
at a, at a rendezvous. Uh, in Utah, we have a, a rendezvous called Fort Buenaventura. It's uh, Easter weekend, and, and I actually trapped that beaver at the rendezvous. 35 so, or 40s? Probably. All right, so we're gonna, we've got a guy that has, has not skinned a beaver before, and uh, it's something that he, he needs to experience. So we're going to kind of have him go through that and walk him through it. And if you guys have questions, um, I know somebody asked me a question on actually how do we trap the beaver, not necessarily the why. And so we can talk about the how. The how? When did he die? He died the same day I caught him. <laughs> he's been frozen. Yeah, he's been in my freezer. <laughs> And, and, and like I said earlier, sometimes when we catch beaver, we would ideally we want to show up the next day and he's going to be drowned, dead, floating in the water, and that's it. Sometimes it doesn't happen quite that way and you have to go barbaric on him and club him. And sometimes it's pink, a little tiny hit in the head, they're done. Sometimes you have to go Neanderthal on him. <laughs> And in, and in the history of, of the fur uh, trade, the rendezvous period was really a very short time of the overall, because you have the French period of the fur trade, the British era of the fur trade, and most of the fur during those was actually obtained through the native people, and they weren't trapped with steel traps like this. This came right at the very end, kind of, of the... Uh, Cutting out the middleman. Yeah. And so most, most of the beaver that were trapped or were, that were taken were taken by natives and they were, they were clubbed, they were just whatever they speared, could do. Speared inside the den. What they'd do is they'd find a den or a, a, a lodge and they'd block it off. Then they'd tear apart the top of the, the, top of the lodge and they actually had spears that they'd go in and just spear them right inside to where they couldn't get away from. And, and there again, back in the, in the trade days, if you, if you sliced a hole in the beaver or even shot it, no big deal because all they wanted was the fur. Nowadays, oh my lord, if you got one little tiny nick, get the five dollar discount. They're like, oh man, I can't pay you for that hole. So that's why I send mine off because I don't have to deal with the fur buyers. So fur and buyers. It's a lot they more lucrative tell. for us because you guys, you know, may want to buy a beaver pelt and, and so rather than me selling that for six bucks I put the, the 25 to thirty dollars in it to get it tanned and 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 sell it make a little bit of money because you know it, it does you, you don't make money trapping these days because generally you got you gas it because you enjoy it you, yeah so most of the stuff that I do anyway is is depredation oh, so the, the beaver are places where they shouldn't be causing problems in the United States beaver cause millions and millions of dollars of damage and so Guys like us have to go in and control those those populations and those numbers. Now in Colorado, you cannot use this steel jaw trap to catch beaver. And I know of no other way to catch them to get rid of them. But down there they actually have these big giant <laughs> cages. cages and the beaver gets inside it, <laughs> comes around and catches them inside it. Then the next morning you come in there either with a 22 or a billy club and take care of it. But in case you happen to catch a dog or a small child or something like that in it, then you you know you can always release them. Go go back home, you know. Um, so why call it? I think California is getting that way too, where you can't. You have to. Well, I know for a fact that Washington State you have to live trap them. And if you ever catch one. Once in that trap, you'll probably never catch them again. It's kind of like catching toads. You ever caught one missing a toe? <laughs> Hardly ever. I've caught one in all my years of trapping. I've caught one beaver that was missing a toe. Guys, right, evidently they realize what to stay away from, and it kind of makes them a little trap-wise, and they just stay away from there. But what the mountain men go ahead and slice them up and start start slicing. Them. So. Trapping beaver, you have to get in the water. You don't, you don't, you can't set your trap and set it in the water, at, you know, from the bank because my feet stink. Even even after I wash them, they still stink. And beavers use their nose a lot. If you look at their noses, they've got good sized noses. So <clears throat> you want to stay well. When I find a location, 
Like I want to set that trap. See this shadow? This right here is the water, that's the bank. I want to stay inside the water, but right here is where I want to put the trap. So what I'll do is I'm over here on the bank. So if the water is flowing in this direction, I want to step into the water downstream from where I want to put the trap. Wade up here to where I want to put the trap, then I set my trap. This right here is a number five bridger. Notice where my hand's at right now. There's no way that even if that trap went off, it would catch my finger. So you always want to keep your fingers outside the jaws. Many years as I've trapped, I've only caught that thumb one time. And it was totally by accident. I had a little demonstration for fourth graders and Casper. And it slipped off. And it actually caught my thumb back in this direction. So, like, how do you do this? So I actually had to have a buddy out. You want to squeeze this open for me? And luckily enough, it wasn't a wham. It didn't catch me. It just kind of slipped off and grabbed a hold of me. That's one time since. First time I started trapping was probably, I want to say 75, 76. The very first beaver I ever caught was back in 1976. So, I depressed that first spring, used as much as I can, then I used that leg to actually hold it open or hold it shut. I can use both hands because my right hand is my weaker hand. Open that up. See where my thumb's at right now? Even if that was to go off, it wouldn't catch my thumb. Set that. I always bring the jaws or the springs back to me. There again. See where my thumb's at? If it goes off, all my thumb's going to do is slip off. See how flat that's sitting right now? If I set it back this way, see how it's not sitting down all the way? So that's why anytime you set your traps, you set it back, let's pull it down. Now it's as nice and flat as possible. Oop. Then what I did just then was I fine set the, the trigger where when the beaver comes along and he steps on that trap, all he's got to do is just barely move it. Watch how far that moves before it snaps. I mean, all he's got to do is just barely hit it and it's going to catch him. These jaws are designed a big enough hole, big enough uh, space here that when it catches these beavers, it'll catch them deep to where sometimes if you catch them on the front foot, they'll actually wring their foot off. Or if you just catch them by the toe, they'll wring their toes off before they get a chance to drown. Oh, what? Somebody said something. So, I've got this trap set, and I'm right here where I want to set the trap. So I come up, set my trap right there, and what I like to do is put it about that deep in water. It's about six inches deep. So if I was to touch that pan, the water would hit me right about there. I don't ever stick my hand in there. I just kind of know where that depth is. Set that trap there. Notice how long the chain I have. And the extra rope. The rope is for, I take a stake and come back over here where the water is a lot shallower instead of out here where it's <gasps> that deep. I can take this and stake it inside the water, not up on the bank. I want it to be inside the water because I've had twice that I couldn't stake it in the water. I actually had to stake it on the bank. Both times the beaver will actually take that rope and bite it and cut it. I've had I've had to do it twice and both times the beaver has cut it. It just it happens. I don't know why why a beaver would single out that rope <laughs> rather than you know chewing everything else up. So the next morning, after the beaver comes over here. Well, let me, let me back up a little bit. The castor gland that, that we're going to pull out of there, 
<clears throat> you take that and you take a stick, good size stick, and dip it in that beaver caster. And all you need is just a little dab, a little, kind of like dippity do, just a little dab will do this. Dip that in there, and then I stick it, <coughs> most time in the water, and stick it in the bank to where it's hanging over the trap, but still about six inches away from it before they get to the trap. Then I'll use sticks, natural sticks that's around, you know, beaver chews and stuff like that, and kind of funnel the beaver into right there. So you put them sticks there, and the beaver comes along, and he can smell that caster gland. The beavers always use the caster gland to mark their territory, kind of like a dog hiking his leg. But whenever we use that caster gland, it's not from this creek. It's from that creek way over there. Because the food that they're eating is just a little bit different, and their caster gland will actually smell a little bit different. So here's Mr. Beaver. He's swimming downstream, and all of a sudden he's like, hey, 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 wait a minute. What's going on here? And he can smell that caster. He'll come over to investigate. And if you have that stick, about a foot above the water, but in behind the trap. He's coming over the bank. Whenever a beaver is swimming, they always have their front legs kind of just dangling there. And they're swimming with their back legs. And when they get close enough to the bank, they start feeding for the bank. And first thing they do is they find that trap. He's trying to jack, you know, and I want that beaver to be up on his tippy toes, smelling for that, that caster gland. And he's tippy toeing and People say, well, the water's gonna be murky to where you can't see it. I've had clear water because up in the mountains, the water's nice and clear. And you can see the trap from the bank. But the beaver, he's not looking underneath the water. He's looking for that beaver cast. And they'll come up. Then what they'll do, da, da, da. try to do this, but I can't, ah, my foot, no. <laughs> he jumped. <laughs> so the beaver's caught, and the weight of that trap is enough to drown a beaver. It is not. <coughs> Usually, what I'll do is I'll take a canvas bag, put some river rocks in it, quick rocks, and then wire it just about right there. When the beaver dives, he'll he'll dive. When he first gets caught, he still has quite a bit of energy. He'll dive towards that deeper water. If anybody's been up in the high country and been in any of them ponds, the water level goes like this, and then all of a sudden it just dives off, right? To the deep, what I call the abyss. The beaver, I always put that bag of rocks right there on the edge of that drop off. So when the beaver hits the end of that rock or end of the chain and moves that bag that far, it's going to take him right to the bottom. The next morning, I'm coming up along the bank there, and I'm up here on the bank, and I see myself a nice tight rope. I know I got a beaver. Go back downstream, get back in the water, dun 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 dun. Grab a hold of this rope, I'm in that much water. I don't have to go wading in water that deep again. And then all I gotta do is just reel them in, take them out of the trap, throw them up on the bank, Reset the trap, grab the beaver from the bank, wait downstream, jump back out of the water. And I've got my beaver for the day. Is he done yet? He's getting there. He's getting there? <coughs> I've read accounts from the 1800s where the company men had trappers, then they had the camp tenders. The camp tenders did all of our skinning for us. <laughs> because by the time we got back to camp, we've been in water this deep all day. So we're just trying to get warmed up. Where this guy's getting paid to be the camp tender. And that's his job is to skin the beaver. Area right there, right there on the back of the hip bone. On the side, there's a lot of flesh, a lot of meat, a lot of fat, everything else. You know, you can just you can skin with your eyes closed. But right there on the backbone, there is nothing. And so you have to take these little tiny cuts to get off of there without cutting the hide. It, it takes years and years and years, like, yeah, 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 to slice that off. Right, yeah, right where the